what your lab is working on, right? What do you see as some of the most promising technology uh, in longevity at the moment? Or I guess extending health span, because that's really the focus. I wouldn't say the most, I wouldn't answer with the most promising, but one of the biggest questions I have is around the mm -hmm. translation of rapamycin. Of course, it's mm -hmm. one of the lips. So rapamycin is a drug, as many of your audience will know, uh, that's used for transplant recipients at the moment in the clinic, but at least in animal, animal models, appears to be quite robust at extending lifespan. You know, it's mm -hmm. a fairly consistent result um, across many different species, you know, delivered even just late in life or uh, for a brief period in the middle of life, it seems to extend lifespan. But, you know, rapamycin's uh, target is this, well, the enzyme is called TOR or mTOR, which stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. In any case, that, that uh, target in the cell, it controls uh, protein synthesis and protein breakdown, and it's sensitive to protein intake. So uh, one of the biggest problems in the clinic, of course, is frailty. When people get old, they lose their muscle mass. This causes them to fall over, uh, break their hip, and it's just, you know, start of a very rapid decline in health. So we absolutely need to maintain muscle mass in older people. And there are fantastic uh, results in the clinic from resistance training. Mm -hmm. So getting you know, older people to lift weights, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, maintaining that muscle mass is, is incredibly important. But, you know, maintaining muscle mass requires uh, being able to synthesize protein. And so, you know, if we're blocking protein synthesis with rapamycin, does this mean that people will lose muscle mass or not put on as much muscle mass? And this is going to be the big trade-off, I think, when it comes to the practical um, uh, clinical trial of rapamycin in humans for you know health span or you know potentially even lifespan what's going to be the trade-off between uh, you know these fantastic results for longevity and blocking new uh, muscle growth you know, the answer may be cyclic dosing um, potentially when people are young i definitely think that for people who are already frail and have uh, poor muscle mass uh, we really have to exercise a lot of caution um, and that's sort of the biggest question i have I don't know the answer to it. Do you think, you, just your thoughts on how much protein like a an older person should be eating? Is yeah. like high protein better? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. And it's related to this other one, right? So yeah. uh, obviously if uh, people have a big dose of protein and then they then hit the gym and do resistance training, they can put on muscle mass. It's That's fairly clear. It's pretty obvious, right? But then there's this whole nutritional geometry. And I've uh, had the pleasure of collaborating with people like uh, Steve Simpson and David Raubenheimer and David Lacouder um, at the University of Sydney, who look at um, the composition of diets from a sort of um, mathematical perspective. So if we consider that there are three main macronutrients that we eat, so there's proteins, there's carbs, there's fats, rather than sort of giving a high protein diet or a high carb diet or whatnot, they mathematically, uh, uh, set animals up onto every different combination, mm -hmm. every potential combination of proteins, the carbs, the fats. And, you know, they have this uh, framework that allows you to do so uh, and map that out. And when you do that experiment, it turns out that the animals on a low protein and high carb diet live the longest. Those in a high protein, low carb uh, are lean and uh, quite healthy and fertile when they're younger, but end up having a shortened lifespan. So, you know, what does that mean for the clinic? So mm -hmm. part of the reason that the animals on a high protein diet are skinny and looking great is that they don't eat as much. And those that are on a low protein, high carb diet end up being slightly chubby fat. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they do so is that they're overeating. So it turns out our appetite, and this seems to be very well conserved across evolution, mm -hmm. our appetite, you know, how much we decide to eat is determined by the amount of protein that we get altogether. Mm -hmm. So it appears that our bodies have what we call a protein target. And every day our bodies say, okay, we are going to be hungry until we eat X amount of protein. Now, if you're eating a, a high carb, low protein meal, uh, there's, as far as we understand, people will continue to feel hungry until they keep that protein target. And so that's why things like the uh, paleo diet or Atkins diet are so successful for weight loss. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a lump of steak, as I uh, was fortunate enough to do last night, <laughs> because I had that, uh, that hunger, uh, you've, you feel full very early on, right? Mm. You don't need to keep eating it. It's because I've hit my protein target. Uh, and so uh, uh, this is relevant to the total amount of calories that you eat. 
But what does that mean for improving long-term health and lifespan? So you could say, well, maybe we'll uh, restrict protein from people so that they live longer. Now, the difficulty with that is our um, internal drive for appetite is almost impossible to overcome. <laughs> uh, there may be some people out there who have just some incredible willpower, uh, which may last a, a brief period of time. But in the long run, everyone comes off their diet and they switch back to what they really want, which is a set tar uh, protein target every day. So we can't really do that, you know, tell people to restrict their, their protein intake. When it comes to older people in particular, as I said, we need them to maintain their muscle mass. So, you know, for very frail older people, we need them to eat more nutrients. Um, you know, everyone talks about calorie restriction, but for those uh, in the nursing home who are frail, actually the main challenge is getting more calories into them. So if we were to give them high protein meals, on the one hand, um, it could help maintain muscle mass. On the other hand, maybe it impacts their, um, their protein thermostat and they aren't as hungry. And so they're just not getting enough calories. So uh, mm -hmm. after all of that, I'm not sure of the answer is what I'm saying. There's this interesting uh, finding that you can deliberately restrict protein intake and extend lifespan in a mouse, but deliberately restricting protein intake in humans is I think going to be very difficult to do on any practical level. And of course the other, sorry, the other one thing to add is that it relates to your previous question about uh, the previous uh, topic around rapamycin and mTOR. Mm. So yeah. high protein, protein intake appears to, well, we know that it triggers mTOR signaling. Mm. So, you know, there's your trade-off. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, one last question. Uh, what Would you be able to share your personal longevity protocol? What, what is it that you do to, to, to maintain your health span? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So uh, it becomes a bit philosophical, right? Are you willing mm. to sacrifice your uh, standard of living or quality of life now for potentially maybe improved longevity mm. later on? So, you know, there's some pretty decent color correlates with fairly sensible, boring stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a, a varied diet, uh, trying to avoid stress, sleeping well, doing lots of exercise. So, uh, you know, my, I do manage to achieve uh, calorie restriction and uh, cardiovascular exercise by mm -hmm. not having enough um, time in the day to eat lunch and constantly being late for every meeting I have to get to and having to run to get there on time. <laughs> so... <laughs> Those are my two forms of uh, <laughs> longevity intervention. You know, when, when I'm more disciplined, I try and um, exercise in the morning. I'm very fortunate in that, in that I live um, not too far from uh, a beach here in Sydney and, um, you know, doing some exercise and going for a swim in the ocean is fantastic. Mm. Uh, but I mostly do that for the later effects, which is being able to concentrate for the rest of the day much better. So look, those are my, my <laughs> tips. <laughs> Okay, go for a swim in the ocean. No, that that is that that would be excellent. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Wu, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was great talking to you and going through that paper. And uh, yeah, where can people find out more about what your lab is doing and your latest research? Uh, yeah, look, uh, we have a, a lab website. Um, uh, got my personal profile on uh, UNSW. Uh, so follow me on Twitter if you really like. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'm always happy to jump on uh, meetings like this. It was absolutely a pleasure. And thanks for taking interest in the paper. I, it was excellent. Thank you. And hopefully we will get to talk again. Yep. Yeah, thanks. All right. Great chatting.